Okay, today's lecture is on brain evolution, but also on the use of animal model systems in research, because we're really switching gears from the more cellular aspects of understanding how action potentials work uh, that we did in the first uh, part of the class, and also the neuroanatomy that we went over. And we're moving towards really uh, what's called systems neuroscience, understanding uh, the sensory systems, the motor systems, and the higher cognitive systems. And for this type of research, we do a lot of work in animal model systems. So it's important you understand not only evolution and how animals and their brains relate to each other, but also the rationale for why we use animals in, um, in experimental research today. Um, what is the goal of that? What is the use and what are the kinds of regulations? Okay, so um, I want to start today with um, evolution. And, um, oops, sorry, let me just grab my pointer. Here it is. Okay. So um, one of the reasons we study evolution is um, to better understand ourselves. And so probably the easiest example is the study of uh, behavior in non-human primates in, in monkeys. And I was lucky enough when uh, I went on my last sabbatical to be able to go to Botswana and actually um, study the behavior of um, wild baboons, chakma baboons, in the Okavanga Delta in um, Botswana uh, for about a month during my sabbatical. So this is me in my Jane Goodall pose, looking at the normal behavior of this group of chakma baboons that are very, very used to having human observers. So I'm really not uh, disturbing them. By this point, they were very familiar with me, so they were just going about their normal business. But when you go out there and you observe these baboons in the wild, the thing that you realize is how similar they are to human behavior and human interaction. There's lots of social grooming, kind of equivalent to all the conversations that um, we have with different people. There's lots of play. So these are three little baby baboons uh, playing on um, an anthill, a really humongous anthill that you're going to see a little bit better in the next um, slide. This is uh, an anthill, and um, which was so cool to me unless until they told me that um, when the ants have gone away, so this is a, a abandoned ant hill, um, that snakes go in and live in there. So I, I stayed away. This was a telephoto lens, but you can see the ba the baboons were not having um, were not worried about it at all. Here is uh, King of the Mountain up here um, surveying his uh, friends from the very top of this very high ant hill. Here's a little closer uh, view. He's eating fruit from um, probably marula fruit from this tree right here, um, but just uh, hanging out in, a, in the beautiful morning sun. What you see a lot in non-human primates is, um, and in primates, you and I, is that we're very, very social animals. In non-human primates, it takes the form of grooming. So here is a mega grooming session, the very lucky recipient down here, very uh, relaxing, kind of a spa day kind of situation with um, her friends uh, doing all of the grooming. Uh, very similar to kind of social interactions that we get and we have and we seek out uh, as humans. Um, they not only groom, but they could hang out, kind of looking for some action, as this uh, male baboon, whose name was Elvis, was doing. Um, uh, this was actually the very first baboon that I saw in um, uh, Botswana, the first baboon that was uh, introduced to me in the uh, troop. And he was uh, very proudly sitting there, uh, just hanging out, waiting for um, some lady friends to come by. So it's great to be able to study non-human primate behavior because you see so many different uh, similarities between human behavior and this monkey behavior, particularly in regards to their kinds of social uh, interactions and how they seek out social interactions. But for many, many years, up till about 200 years ago, we thought that each animal species, including different species of monkeys and apes, had evolved completely independently, no relationship between the two, until we started sh looking in more detail at different bone structure that you can see here. Here is the arm, forelimb, flipper, and wing of four different vertebrates, human, arm, dog, 
seal, and bat. Now on the surface, they look very, very dissimilar. But if you look more in detail at how the bones are, are constructed and, and uh, come together, you'll see lots of similarities in um, this uh, uh, long, tall part, uh, upper part of the arm, two um, um, bones making up the lower part of the arm, and then uh, these multiple bones making up the fingers or phalanges of, um, uh, of, of our hands. So looking at this and, and detailing this made us realize that in fact there was evidence that all of us had evolved from earlier ancestors. So at first we just had these kinds of observations but we were in search of a theory. What was that theory that would tie this idea that there's lots of similarities across different vertebrate species to the idea of how this might have come about? And I think you're all familiar with um, the mechanism or theory that was developed, which is the theory of evolution. Two different scientists developed this theory kind of concurrently. Darwin is perhaps the better well known, the most known um, uh, proponent of the theory of evolution. But in fact, Wallace also proposed a very similar, if not identical, um, theory of evolution by natural selection. A theory that says that evolution proceeds by differential success in reproduction, so that there is a gradual change uh, from one species through the other as a function of uh, differential success, how well you do um, after uh, your reproduction and what kinds of traits that you happen to have. So um, it's actually said that Wallace came up with this uh, theory of evolution after a dream. He just popped into his head after having a particular dream. Darwin, by contrast, had been studying this phenomenon and the relationship between um, different species in the world for quite a while. And in fact, one, some of his um, most seminal observations were done um, in the Galapagos Island. You might be familiar with his trip on the USS Beagle uh, to the Galapagos Islands. And one of the, here's Charles Darwin right here. And one of the set of uh, observations that was uh, particularly seminal for his development of the theory of evolution was his observations of finches. So it turns out the Galapagos Islands are a set of islands um, uh, in, in South America. And each one of them is like a very unique microcosm of different kinds of species, different animals. They have slightly different food sources, different kinds of trees growing on them. And what Darwin noticed is that all of the islands had what looked like a subspecies of finch, a type of bird, but each island has its specific kind of finch, and the finches differed in specific ways. Sometimes the beaks were a little bit longer, and he hypothesized that that might be to be able to adapt to the particular kind of fruit or nut that was on that island that required, that required a longer beak. Some of them were larger or smaller, and he noted ways in which that might be an advantage on that particular island. So based on those observations, he wrote this kind of very uh, uh, seminal um, quote from, uh, from uh, some of his writings, saying of his observations of the finches on Galapagos Island, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, the finches, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. So that you can see is the kind of genesis of maybe a, a, a early subspecies was then slightly modified for island one, island two, Island three, and that is uh, illustrated by these common kind of tree-like uh, uh, evolutionary trees, where uh, um, a early species uh, diverges into multiple species. But you can see that some are closer together in the tree, and some are, are very, very far apart. This observation and these observations, simple ob observations with just finches on different islands was really the start of this whole theory of evolution that still guides our thinking about how species are continuing to evolve today. 
Okay, so what specifically was Darwin's hypothesis? His hypothesis was that reproduction will increase a population rapidly unless factors limit it. So you have lots of reproduction going on, that's just normal. Um, but individuals of even the same species are not identical, just like you and I are not identical. Some of us are fantastic musicians. Some of us have really good vision. Some of us have really great hearing. There are clear individual differences between us. And he noticed that not only in us, but in the identical species. Third, some variation is inherited. If you are a fantastic musician, most likely you have someone in your family, maybe one of your parents, one of your, one of your grandparents, an aunt, an uncle, that also is a great musician. Math skills, um, um, uh, dance skills. Um, there is a lot of inheritability of this uh, variation in all of our different traits. And the fourth hypothesis is not all offspring, offspring survive to reproduction. And the idea there is that the variability um, is, uh, and some, some people have good variability, some people have bad variability. The weak, sickly ones do not survive. The smart ones, the ones that can run really fast or have a great sense of uh, uh, fleeing from danger, those are the offspring that survive to reproduce. And then those traits are the ones that get, then get propagated to the next generation. Um, Darwin also inferred that variations affect the probability that they will survive and reproduce. So these variations, that's exactly what I just said, if you're strong and you're smart about getting away from danger, you have what's called adaptations that will increase the likelihood of your offspring not only being born but also surviving. So you can see that little by little, generation by generation, these traits that are particularly useful for your environment will help you survive. And another um, uh, uh, realm of this theory is called sexual selection. That is, each sex has anatomical and behavioral features that favor reproductive success. It could either be in attracting mates or it could be those features that are helping you survive long enough so you can uh, come to an age where you can get a mate. Okay, so um, there are also important uh, general terms that I want you to learn. Um, the idea of convergent evolution is um, that uh, shows that similarities in behavior or structure among unrelated animals can be due to adaptations, adaptations to a similar environment. So what does that mean? Convergent evolution. And the best example there is um, a seal and a tuna fish. So both of them live in the ocean. However, a seal is a mammal, has a very, very different kind of evolutionary history, and a tuna fish is a fish, a very different evolutionary history, but there is convergent evolution so that their arrow, or kind of, I should say, water dynamic um, body frame, their flippers, all both have a lot of similarities that reflect the convergent evolution that they both uh, developed uh, uh, subspecialties to be able to survive very well in the water. Even though the seals uh, developed on land, they're mammals, and they uh, learn to adapt to swimming around in the ocean. And the tuna, of course, are not land dwelling, and they, they develop this uh, for, for their whole life to be in, underwater. Homoplasty is a resemblance between features such as body shape due to convergent evolution. So the fin structure or the aerodynamic structure of seals and tuna fish is an example of homoplasty. Okay, so um, the main point that I want you to take from this short discussion of evolution is that um, you can think, okay, Charles Darwin made these observations in the mid-1800s, in the 1850s, okay? And you think, okay, well, that's, that's a particular time point, and he saw these finches. The idea is that evolution is a continuing process, and that these finches may not be identical today, in 2011, as they were in 1850-something, when Charles Darwin visited them in uh, uh, the HMS Beagle. So, um, Things are changing, evolving over time. Maybe not from day to day or year to year, but certainly 
between the 1800s and um, today, you might expect to see even further evolution of these original species that were um, uh, observed in um, uh, observed by Darwin on the Galapagos Island. I don't know if uh, um, several of you saw or any of you saw um, um, uh, the New York Times Magazine just a couple of weeks ago where they talked about the evolution of the bulldog and how different the bulldog looks today than it, was, than it looked in the 1950s. And this, was a, this is an example of forced change uh, based on breeding practices, but really, if we look at this definition, it's it what's happening. Um, variation is inherited, and then you, you, um, you now artificially go in with these bulldogs and then mate the ones that have these characteristics. You are actually playing evolution. And there's actually a, a very, very striking change. And, and the classic bulldog that you and I are used to seeing in Washington Square Park with the really, really pushed in nose, that has evolved literally over 50 years between the 1950s when the dogs look much less pushed in in their nose. So that is a, a good example of, um, of sped up evolution because of selective breeding that's done not only in bulldogs, but you can see this in lots of dogs as people are trying to get their best show dogs uh, to win the best prizes. But even there, this sets up a really great thought experiment that you can do. <clears throat> And the thought experiment came to me one night as I was walking home um, through the streets of New York. And what did I see but rats? So rats are ubiquitous. They are found in New York City. They are found all over the world. But it, it, it begs a question, it begged a question in my mind. What are the difference between New York City subway rats or even New York City apartment rats and rats that live way out in the suburbs, farming rats that live out in a farming community. Well, obviously, New York rats are different. They wear black, they swear a lot, and they're really rude. But um, uh, there are also clear differences. They learn how to navigate the subway. They know about that third rail that is uh, deadly. Um, they know how to survive when the train comes get into the station and not to get crushed. They know where all the great garbage is, even in a hostile environment. They learn to be really, really aggressive because if they run really fast at you, we humans run away, at least I do. Very, very different from, uh, and, and presumably less aggressive than um, rats that live in much less urban situations. And you could think about here an experiment that you would be able to do, an experiment out in a suburb that is just not too far away, a Long Island rat experiment versus a New York City rat experiment. Are there differences in a aggressivity? Are there differences in cholesterol levels between the rats in these two environments and their general behavior? So um, this could lead to con uh, divergent evolution, where these city rats are bred to be much, much more aggressive, and the country or the um, suburb rats uh, much less aggressive, because they basically don't have to. But the point is that this is happening all the time. You could actually do an experiment today if you wanted to. But these are exactly the features that are not only affecting rats, but they're uh, affecting humans. We're not going to see evolution of ourselves um, um, within probably our lifetimes. But this is a long-acting kind of um, process. OK, so um, that's how evolution happens. Now we need a way to be able to name the different um, species and the different ways that they came together through evolution. And to help us solve this problem is a, a scientist uh, named Linnaeus um, um, who developed a system of classification where each species has two names, a genus, which is a group of species that resemble each other, and a specific species. So our um, genus and species name is Homo sapien, as you're all familiar with. Um, a phylogeny is an evolutionary history of a particular group of organisms and may be represented, as we looked at before, in the form of a family tree. Um, different species show different solutions to environmental changes, like our rats in the suburbs and our rats in the cities. And living animals, along with fossils, allow the study of um, body and brain. So you can look at, uh, in your book, um, the different species and um, um, 
uh, levels of uh, description of uh, these different animals. Uh, order is the highest, um, uh, I should say the lowest level where, where they have the least uh, in common specifically. And then if you're in the same species, it means that you could actually um, reproduce. Okay, so um, you don't need to know uh, all of the different uh, uh, names, basically just genus and species, but just know that there's different names and they help you understand how far away and how similar um, your individual species is to uh, um, much larger and larger general uh, uh, categorization uh, of, of animals, of, of living things. Okay, so we're interested in evolution, specifically for the purposes of our class, for the purposes of studying brain and behavior. So all these organisms, they've all come from the same original subspecies, and what they have in common relative to our target of study, the brain, is a nervous system, even though they might look quite different. Here, as, you've, as you know, is the central and peripheral nervous system of the human. However, even a uh, lowly sea slug, like a plesia, that we're going to be talking about in our learning and memory lectures, have a uh, nervous system made up of uh, group, groupings of um, nerve cells. Uh, worms have a uh, nervous system, a se segmental nerve uh, going down, kind of like a spinal cord. Um, even sea anemone and sea stars have um, a neural ring, a set of neurons that help them um, do all the things that our nervous system helps us do. Sense things and put out motor, motor outputs. Cognitive functions, much harder to find, impossible to find in these species, but basic functions are certainly there. Okay, but let's not look right now at the jump between the human and the sea slug, even though we're, again, we're gonna be focusing on that because the sea slug has told us enormous about, about even about a high level of cognitive function like learning and memory. Now we're not gonna make this jump, but we're gonna ask what about within mammals? The main brain structures are very similar across all mammals, and this should not be so surprising to you from the, um, uh, from the uh, uh, lab sections that you've done on sheep brain and human brain. The rodent brain looks, looks quite similar, and here I've shown you a uh, horizontal section through the rodent brain here compared to our large um, human brain. And you can see uh, all these different areas are color coded and all the major structures that are in the human brain can be easily seen in the same relative position in the rodent brain. So looked at this way, even though on the surface they might look, uh, they, they certainly have some differences. Um, the overall structure and the organization of these two brains, humans and rat, are quite similar. So what are the major differences between these two brains? One, the size, obviously. Size and weight, where this is so much bigger than the rodent brain, and obviously the, bigger, the biggest difference is all of these gyrations of the cortex. So we have size and weight that differ between these two mammalian species, amount of cortex obviously much larger in the human. Um, size of the olfactory bulb, interesting, you can see how large the olfactory bulb is, and as you, as you may know, rodents are excellent at olfactory sense. They have a much, much keener olfactory sense, many more sensors and much more sensitive than our tiny little olfactory bulb, which is, can't even be seen here, but it's certainly, um, as you know, the first cranial nerve. It's there but relative to the amount of brain tissue devoted to olfaction, it is minuscule in the human relative to the rodent. Size of the olfactory bulb, okay, uh, major similarities. Um, while there are these differences um, in size, weight, amount of cortex, and the size of the olfactory bulb, there are even more similarities. So both of the nervous systems in these two mammalian species, and in fact in all mammals, develop from a neural tube that we spoke about very briefly in the first couple of lectures. Uh, both the brains, uh, in, uh, brains in all mammalian species, and particularly in humans and rats, are bilaterally 
symmetrical. You have a right and a left hemisphere, even though the hemispheres themselves and the cortex themselves must be much, are much larger in humans compared to rats. There is segmentation in both of them. And let me just pop back here to show you. It might be even easier to see the segmentation in the rodent, where here is the cortex, here is the thalamus, here is the um, midbrain, here is the pons, here is the medulla oblongata. We can see those same um, uh, subdivisions here, even though the cortex is so much bigger. Here is the thalamus, um, um, midbrain pons and medulla oblongata. That's what I mean by segmentation. There is an equivalent and very, very homologous segmentation um, in, in both these brains. Um, hierarchical control. There are higher cortical areas that control lower cortical areas in both the rodent and the human. And we'll get to that a little bit in some of the later lectures. Um, there are separate systems. So we're about to start the section of the class in which we talk about the visual system, the auditory system, the somatosensory system, and then higher order cognitive systems for memory, for fear, for language, or for attentional control. Um, even though these are much better developed, certainly the language areas are more developed in humans, but also the attention areas, the memory areas, the, um, um, uh, the visual areas, much more developed in humans than in rodents. The rodents still have a, a similar uh, pattern of separate brain systems that control sensory, motor, and cognitive functions. And uh, similarly, uh, kind of related to the separate systems, there is localization of function in the human and the rodent brain. And there's lots of homologies there. Certainly, visual cortex is in the back in the, in the rodent brain, just like it is in the human. OK. So the main point of this slide is to say that brain size and complexity differ across species. So here we're not just looking at mammals, but we're taking a look at different uh, um, types of species from ancestral vertebrates to um, birds that developed even later than mammals, um, uh, snakes, frogs, uh, obviously amphibians, uh, some tilios fishes, sharks, and lampreys. And this is just kind of fun to look at. Again, this is also in your book. Um, because you can look by color code the relative size of the cerebral hemispheres, the optic tectum, which is um, part of the uh, uh, midbrain in the, uh, in the human, but becomes very prominent. Particularly, look at, he, he has all optic tectum in the teleost fish. Cerebellum, as you know, important for fine motor movement and olfactory bulb. So here in mammals, we have lots of cortex and medium olfactory bulb. Remember, we're kind of lumping together humans and rodents. And uh, a pretty big cerebellum. Here, look how much of the optic tectum is, is taking up tiny little cerebral cortex and very small olfactory bulb. Here, kind of the smallest brain uh, possible, you have optic tectum back here. Um, cerebral hemispheres as well as olfactory bulb, but very, very small uh, overall proportion of these things. And you can see similarities between birds and mammals, even though they've, um, they're quite different in terms of their um, cognitive abilities. So just to appreciate the different brain sizes and complexities across species, now that we've looked at the similarities and differences uh, between different mammalian species. Okay. So an interesting question that people have started to address, or that started to address, have addressed for many uh, a long time, is to try and understand what is um, uh, the, who has the biggest brain. And of course, humans came to this, this debate with the preordained answer, we, as humans, have the biggest brain, we are the smartest, we have language clearly, we've never found any other species that reaches our level of higher function. Therefore, um, one early assumption is that the humans, we humans, must have the heaviest brain imaginable. We must have the largest brain that exists in mankind. And so we were happily going around with this idea that our brains are the biggest um, until we found the elephant brain, which, in fact, um, 
is, uh, here's a bush elephant brain, which on the, using just pure weight is much, maybe two, three times heavier than the human brain. And then we went back and said, hmm, maybe that weight thing isn't going to work. Um, then we found whale brains that were not only very huge, very big, but also highly, um, gy there's lots of gyri here. Remember, uh, the gyri is what I was saying, was showing how evolved we are. And look at all the gyri in the elephant brain. So clearly, um, uh, Walt Disney got it wrong. Elephants are not dumbos. They actually have huge brains and huge, um, lots of gyri, uh, maximizing their computing power. I think here, oh, here is a real version of a whale brain. Sorry, this doesn't have a, a, um, uh, a little scale bar to show you how big it is, but it is humongous. So we have um, uh, this, this problem to deal with. In contrast, we were so happy uh, about the size of our brains because we looked at evolution and saw the dinosaurs. For example, I just wanted to show you this funny uh, uh, cartoon that says, the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. This is a conference of dinosaurs. The world's climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. And this uh, uh, chairperson dinosaur is absolutely right. I don't know the last time you've gone to the Museum of Natural History. I went, uh, I think, in September or in October. And just looking at the huge body size and the, the vertebra and the skeleton of these guys, but also seeing their teeny tiny little skulls make you realize that, boy, there was not a lot up there controlling all the rest of this. So clearly, um, I think we would easily have beaten the dinosaurs, even though they're so big in terms of absolute mass of, of brain. Um, but of course, um, we uh, lost out uh, in the African, uh, when we looked at the size of the African elephant brain and then the whale brain as well. So how are we going to look at this? It turns out that absolute size of the brain just isn't going to do it for us. We still think, even though elephants actually are very, very intelligent, there's a lot of communication that happens there, there's lots of social interactions that happen there, even with all of that and the communication that we know that happens in whales, we still uh, know that our level of communication and our level of, of thought process, um, I think we are, we're still on pretty firm ground that it is uh, uh, higher than either a whale or an elephant. So um, they started looking at different proportions. They said, okay, well, brain mass, uh, we want to do a ratio of brain weight to body weight. That might put us on top where we should be. And they did that, and what they found that is that we were not on top. In fact, a little shrew, which is like a little mouse uh, weasel-like uh, animal, has an even higher brain to body ratio uh, um, higher, you know, larger brain to body ratio than we do. So that simple um, um, uh, calculation did not work. What they did is looked at what we're seeing here, which is brain weight as a function of body weight, uh, looking at that ratio for all, um, for lots of mammals. And you can see that the slope of this average line is, um, is about average, is, is, it shows the average, and shows that all um, mammals are within a pretty narrow range. Um, what it turns out to be most valuable to look at is not um, just the slope overall, but what you can look at is how far deviated are these individual points for individual animals from the slope of the line. The slope is the average. So if you're farthest away, um, from the average, this is a, a distance from, uh, say, this line to the uh, slope of the median line, that shows that you have a largest deviation from the line. And that turns out to be a very useful calculation. So um, I talked about total body, uh, total brain weight. We thought that was uh, the key measure first. And shrews, that little weasel-like structure, 0.25 grams, and we go up and up and up. Chimpanzees, not surprisingly, uh, higher, humans higher, but then we have the elephant 
that that was a problem. Okay? Then we did brain weight as a percentage of body weight. And the elephant weight went way back down, 0.2, because of its big body. Even though its brain was big, its body was even bigger. Um, you have chimpanzees that turned out not so great. In fact, uh, the rodent was higher than the chimpanzees. We did better than the rodent, but this little tree shrew won the race. And so this clearly is not a, a good um, indicator of, of overall level of intelligence until we found what's called the encephalization factor. And that is what I was talking about. All you need to know, it is the distance from the median line away. Um, so you could have a positive encephalization factor. If you go down here, you're a negative encephalization factor. And you're basically looking for these points over the line, the larger brain weights, <clears throat> that they're farthest away from the average line. And it turns out that when you use that calculation. It is the human comes out by far. And it actually looks, uh, uh, all the different animals come into their relative right place based on everything we know about their behavior and cognition. The higher apes come out really high. Elephants, very intelligent, but certainly not number one and not the end. They come out in their right place. And then down here, the true shrew and the rodent get put in their their relative position, which is relatively low on the scale. So just an interesting exercise in trying to figure out what is so important about the brain. Is it just the structure? Is it the weight? What is the relationship between the brain and the body weight? And again, the key is encephalization factor, distance from this mean line that you're looking at the relationship between overall brain to body weight in um, uh, vertebrate species. Okay, so um, now we have a little bit of an understanding of the size of the brain and, and what features are um, kind of uh, uh, um, influencing uh, the size of the brain and how we can take that as a function of, of higher levels of cognition. I want to uh, turn now to the question of using these different uh, vertebrate animals and sometimes invertebrate animals to study neuroscience and why we actually choose to study particular species. And again, this is a nice introduction to the whole rest of the course where we're going to be talking about the use of animals in research and why would we use one animal over the other? Why don't we just use elephants all the time? Well, they're way too expensive and we don't have enough room to house them, but there are even more important practical and um, scientific reasons why we choose particular species. One is we are paying attention to the particular spe uh, features of that species for the questions that we're interested in. For example, auditory function. We uh, want to study auditory function not in a species that can barely hear, but uses a species that uses auditory information in a very precise way. And so we study bats. We're going to be doing a great um, homework assignment where you are going to test your bat echolocation abilities. It's basically an auditory perceptual experiment that you can do at home with a partner. <clears throat> and we study bats because they not only listen to the um, um, sound weight inf information in the outside environment, but they've developed a very unique specialization where they emit um, these little sound calls, and what they're measuring is the echo back from the environment. So then, in fact, using their auditory information to see physical elements. So if I was a bat right here, I would be beeping all the way around the room. And the, the way that sound wave is coming back is telling me there's a column here. There's a column here. There, there's chairs down here, but kind of this space is pretty much empty. <clears throat> Their auditory system not only is able to hear, um, for example, uh, uh, um, I could hear you talking if you were talking, <clears throat> but it's also been specialized to interpret the back propagation of these sound waves as they bounce back from solid, um, solid elements. <clears throat> and so this very specialized function is something that uh, we've really taken advantage of in um, studying the auditory system of the specialized um, animal, the bat. <clears throat> Another specialization that we take advantage of is found in rhesus monkeys. 
uh, which are a relatively, uh, actually a very small proportion of animals studied generally in research, but they are so valuable because their visual system, their motor functions, sensory motor integration using motor and visual input to work your way around the world, their memory and their attentional brain systems resemble so much those of humans that they become a very, very uh, important model. Now, if I wanted to study olfaction, I would not choose the rhesus monkeys because like uh, humans, they have a relatively less developed olfactory system. You certainly want to study it in rats um, or per, even in flies that have a very developed olfactory system. So you take the system that you want to study it and study it in a species that has particularly well-developed features in that particular area. Certainly, um, monkeys like humans have a very well-established visual cortex. It turns out that the monkey retina is almost identical to the human retina. So to be able to study things that afflict humans, like macular degeneration, retinal degeneration, you can study it very, very precisely in monkeys, not in flies. OK, rats. Many, many of the research studies done um, uh, to address sensory, motor, even cognitive functions are done in rodents. Why? Because they're small, they can reproduce, they're not in, uh, endangered, they're vertebrates that have, as we talked about, so many similarities in the overall uh, uh, organization of the nervous system. And it turns out that they have been very, very useful, and not just for simple systems. One of the researchers here that we'll talk about more de uh, in more detail later on in the class, Joe Ledoux, is a world expert in the study of fear. We want to study fear because fear is at the heart of so many neuro, uh, neurological disorders, like post-traumatic post um, um, stress syndrome. Um, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders have a component of emotion and fear. And it turns out there's one structure in the rodent and in the human brain called the amygdala that is critical for processing fear information. We process this information using a task called fear conditioning. We'll go over this in much greater detail. It's a very simple task that all of you might, uh, um, could experience for yourself or probably have experienced in the past. So what we do is we play a tone for a rat. The rat, this is just the rat orienting. He's not scared of it. It's just an innocuous tone. It's not too loud. It's just a tone. And we play the tone until the rat just is ignoring the tone. He knows there's nothing, nothing uh, surprising about that tone. But then we play a bad trick on um, the rat. We pair the tone with that nasty sounding sound that just came up, which is um, a, a shock, an electric shock to the floor of this little room that the rat is sitting in. So we have concurrent that sound that used to not mean anything, and now the sound is associated with a shock. Even a small number of parents, especially if the shock is a, a pretty good one, will cause the rat to then fear the sound. And so later, when the sound is, is played all by itself, even without the shock, the rat will react in fear. He will freeze. He will do a deer in the headlights kind of response. He will increase his heart rate. He will increase his stress hormones. He will have a classic fear response. As we'll learn, this, uh, uh, this whole circuit is dependent on one brain, key brain structure called the amygdala. It's also doing exactly the same in humans. And so working out um, the circuits, uh, the cellular uh, um, neurotransmitters, and the molecular mechanisms that are underlying fear responses, we can do this very easily and elegantly in both rats and um, mice. Uh, can really tell us a lot about the syndrome that affects so many humans, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and all the other um, um, neurological, uh, not neurological, but neuropsychological kinds of syndromes that have a basis in fear. OK, so rats are very, very useful and widespread use of this particular species. OK, birds can be used. Their specialization is spatial functions. There are, turns out, food storing birds and non-food storing birds. The food storing birds, those are the interesting ones because they 
um, start storing food in um, the late fall when all the trees are, are on and they're starting to store their little caches of food, sometimes over areas that are like 30 miles wide. So this is a large uh, area that the animals have to remember where they store just a tiny little seed. So you can't be off by several feet or else you're never, never going to find your seeds. You have to remember where those seeds are found and you also have to remember it um, as the uh, environment is changing drastically from fall into winter. All those leaves, many of those leaves are falling off. The climate looks very different. You have snow on the ground in winter, and you have these birds that can remember the precise location of where they um, stored, they cached their seeds and nuts and whatever else foodstuffs that they are hiding over an area that can be 30 miles by 30 miles. That's huge. Spatial memory functions, it turns out, depends on a structure that is analogous to the human hippocampus. And you can see that um, hippocampal volume in the non-storing bird species, sorry, in the food storing bird species here in red is significantly higher um, than uh, the non-food storing bird species. We're looking at the hippocampal volume as a function of the telencephalon, you know, those cortical areas, telencephalic volume, okay? So you can study, um, spatial functions, uh, both the neurobiology underlying it as well as the behavioral aspects in this particular specialized uh, system in the bird. Birds are also great to study um, a, um, uh, the motor components of language. Okay, so they, they don't speak a language, but uh, they have a very interesting uh, pattern that is similar to humans. So if you raise humans, um, and you, don't, you have a baby and you don't speak to that baby for the first two or three years of their life, they will never learn normal language. And similarly, birds, if a little baby bird is born and you don't sing for that bird, that bird will not learn how to sing. So human infants and bird infants must um, benefit, must have auditory input from a teacher subject, mom, dad, or mom, dad, bird, um, if you're a bird, um, uh, uh, to actually develop normal speech patterns. So it's an auditory function, but it's actually a motor function. So this is part of what we call sensory motor integration, matching um, your motor output, your babbling that little babies do that you can tell it's kind of they're trying to uh, imitate what you say, um, uh, and they eventually learn how to speak just like an adult. And similarly, in birds, they have baby bird babble. So there are sounds that baby birds make that are just like babbling. In humans, they have similar elements, but they make no sense. They actually do not make a song. But then over a period of about 90 days, these birds develop what's called crystallized song, and they're able to learn how to sing, just like over the first 10 uh, years of our lives, we learn, we learn how to speak and speak in a more kind of adult way. Um, uh, as we grow up. And so we can study the parts of the brain that are involved, um, that are associated with the striatum. Remember we talked about, or we will talk about, um, we, we identified the structures in the anatomy part of the class, and we will talk about this part of the brain as part of the motor system, important for fine motor control. Certainly there's a lot of fine motor control that goes into all of the mechanisms that I'm using to speak to you today, all the muscles that I use to move my mouth, to move my tongue, to um, pass wind through my um, voice box is all very delicate and um, uh, partially uh, dependent on the striatum. And these striatal structures are also critical for song development. Um, uh, striatal like systems are important for song development in the bird. OK, um, so we're taking advantage of outstanding features in birds, in bats, in rhesus monkeys, um, uh, and uh, in rodents as well. Convenience is another big aspect. Again, elephants are not very convenient. Horses are not very convenient. They're just too big. They eat too much. We don't have enough room from them. Convenience, rats, hard to beat uh, the rat. They're easy to breed. Um, they're easy to raise in, uh, uh, um, in, in the lab. And um, again, they are one of the most used species, but uh, mice are also, particularly with the development of all of these um, genetic mice where you can put specific genes in or take 
specific genes out called knock-in or knock-out mice. And because their reproductive cycle is so quick, you can do it on a relatively quick time scale and be able to look at the effects of um, putting in or taking out specific subsets of, um, of, uh, uh, um, of specific genes. These have become um, very valuable uh, uh, animals. And because specific genes has been linked to things like um, autism or Rett syndrome, which is a, a subset of autism, um, having these mice where you can take out individual genes and see what happens to the behavior and the neurobiology of the entire animal have, ha, is really, really valuable. OK, flies also used for their ability to be uh, able to use the genetics of flies. Um, and they have actual behaviors as well. You can, the fear conditioning that I showed you in rats can also be done in flies as well. So some elegant work uh, on motor systems, sensory systems, olfaction is studied in, in rodents. Memory, uh, sorry, in flies. Memory is studied in, in flies as well. OK, convenience. Third, comparison. <clears throat> Very interesting comparative studies can be done on various species. And our very last lecture in this course, The Neurobiology of Love, is going to focus on one of those interesting comparisons. And the comparisons are is between two separate vole species. Vole is a, a little rodent-like structure. He's very cute. And there's two subspecies that have been studied in uh, the neurobiology of affiliative behavior, otherwise known as the neurobiology of love. One of them is um, the prairie vole. The prairie vole is monogamous. They form lifelong pair bonds. If one dies, the other one doesn't form another pair bond. Um, the other subspecies of vole is called the montane vole. The montane vole is um, polygamous. It has sex with any other vole that it comes across. Doesn't matter. Uh, they're much more solitary. Um, they're like the swinging single of the vole family, whereas the um, um, uh, prairie vole is much more family oriented. They live in family units. And, um, this, uh, uh, people have studied the differences between these two structures, the difference in neurobiology that might underlie the um, polygamous and the uh, uh, swinging single kind of characteristic of the one subspecies of vole, um, um, the montane vole, versus the family uh, um, monogamous <clears throat> pattern of behavior of the prairie vole. And we're going to talk about what exactly underlies that. But being able to study comparative aspects of different species is also very, very valuable. OK, preservation is yet another reason why we study particular species. Uh, certainly, the uh, panda bear, uh, red kangaroos, and green pythons are three uh, endangered species. And so lots of uh, uh, research, including neurobiological research, is done on them to help them uh, um, live, uh, uh, preserve the species. And I never noticed this before, but look how huge the panda bear head is. I wonder whether what his uh, brain size to body ratio is. I don't think they're known as particularly bright animals, but uh, he does look like he has an enormous head. OK, and uh, economic importance. Uh, we do a lot of um, uh, research, uh, both neurobiological and physiological, on species that we use in agriculture, the cow and the sheep. Uh, one thing you might not know about sheep is that um, despite, uh, in addition to their use for their, their clothing and their, their meat, um, they actually have a very, very um, um, precise visual system. You may think that all these sheep look alike, but these sheep can actually visually recognize pictures of other sheep in their herd and do it at a very, very high level. So um, face identification had been, has been studied in sheep. They're not particularly convenient to use. They're a little bit big. They eat a lot. And, um, uh, but they do have an amazing um, ability to recognize other sheep faces. Not other human faces, but other sheep faces, which is quite astounding um, uh, to uh, when you actually get down to the neurobiology of it. They're easily able to recognize the difference where you and I would have a, a really, really hard time. OK, and uh, the last reason um, is uh, treatment of disease. So um, there are particular 
species of animals that have uh, that are much more um, likely to get particular diseases, and we. We study those species so we can understand both the vulnerability and have a, a, a large population of the affected um, um, animal to, to study. And so two examples are narcolepsy can be quite uh, common in dogs and beagles in particular, and baboons uh, have a, a, a relatively high incidence of epilepsy. Epilepsy is a very, very common and can be debilitating the disease, uh, you'll learn about patient HM that had severe, severe epilepsy. To this day, patient HM was first diagnosed in the 1950s, but even today we are still looking for um, important cures uh, and remedies for uh, epilepsy, and um, the baboon model is very useful for that. Okay, but what I want to end with is a bigger question. And that question, as we move into these more systems level or cognitive uh, sensory motor questions, systems level neuroscience, is the question of what is the usefulness of using research, uh, animals in research? Why are we using these animals? Is it just for fun? What is the purpose? Why do we do it? What are the benefits? And what are the different kinds of research? Well, why we do it is that as um, there are a lot of uh, false statements out there that say that, oh, you don't have to use animals, you can do it just as well in dead tissue, or you can use models. This, I'm telling you, is absolutely not true. Um, we do it because the only way to understand a living biological system is to, is to study a living biological system. Um, much, much of the work that we do cannot be done in dead tissue. The work that can be done in dead tissue is being done in dead tissue. But the vast majority of the open questions require use of a living biological system. So science cannot move forward without access to it. And that is part of the reason why we do it. What are the benefits? Well, the benefits are twofold. The first benefit is clinical. So there's some research <clears throat> that gets justified and is certainly justifiable because I am studying this animal to cure Alzheimer's disease. I'm studying this animal to cure um, um, schizophrenia. And um, some of the uh, studies done in animals are done specifically to test hypotheses about these known um, um, neuropathological systems. And that is very, very useful research and, and kind of the most exciting directions towards uh, the best cures that we have today are these kinds of questions. But that's not the only question that's going to be critical to actually get to the cure. Basic research means using animals, in this case, to answer questions about um, how the brain works normally. How does the hippocampus work to solve memory? This is, I'm not studying Alzheimer's disease. I'm not studying memory impairment. I just want to know how the hippocampus works. That information that I glean, and this happens to be one of the questions that I address in my lab, is eventually going to be critical once we get closer to a cure, because we also need to know how the hippocampus works normally. Can I guarantee that the work in my lab will contribute directly to a cure for Alzheimer's disease? No, but the problem is that we know from hundreds of years of scientific work that these links that happen and what, uh, that what eventually turns into a cure for a disease or a neurological system cannot be um, predicted based on, okay, only if you say you're interested in that, then your research will be, only be one, will be the only research that's relevant. Sometimes this person's research that's really interested in Alzheimer's disease is going to be benefited by a wide range of other studies, uh, other basic research uh, uh, studies and, and findings that had been done for completely different reasons, but for a reason that we still don't understand yet will become very, very critical. So these two together are going to do two important things. They're going to help us solve some of the most devastating neurological conditions, epilepsy, um, um, schizophrenia, uh, manic polar 
um, um, bipolar disorder, uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, the cognitive declines in aging. Um, uh, all of these things are going to be solved not only through the direct clinical research that are directed directly at a particular disease, but through basic research. And that's why we need to do it. Okay. Um, I just a word on how research is regulated. You might think, oh, well, anybody who you know is associated with a university or just anybody on the street can go out, take some animals, and start experimenting on them. That is not what happens at all. That in fact, there's very, very strict regulations at the level of the U.S. Um, DA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture. They've set forth federal regulations governing the care and use of animals in biomedical research that are literally considered more extensive than those covering human research subjects. Not to say that you can do anything you want with humans, but they are particularly um, uh, concerned and very, very careful about how animals are used in research. There is an Animal Welfare Act that, is, uh, that maintains how much, uh, uh, how much care they get, uh, the kinds of care, the kinds of husbandry, cleaning, food, water, um, um, uh, enrichment that they give. And each institution, including NYU, has in, in, institutional review boards in place um, uh, to regulate uh, all the research that goes on. You're not allowed to do any research until all of your uh, practices have been written about, written up by you, and reviewed by a panel of both scientists in your area, outside your area, as well as from the community. So it is quite a uh, very regulated process. And the goals of this process is to reduce the number of animals used while still getting significant results. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to use 5,000 because I'm likely to get more, you know, I'll have more chances to find, it, uh, find a, a significant result. You must show us the statistics that, statistics that show us what is the minimum number of animals that you will need to use to get a significant result if one is likely to be there. So uh, again, very strongly regulated. Um, and I'll just end with a few facts versus myths. And I want to go over this because we, uh, from now on, are really going to start focusing on some um, on, on experiments done in animals. I want you not to just take it at, at face value. OK, she says you do it in animals, you do it in animals. But why we're doing it, um, what is the rationale why we choose a particular animal, and also, uh, very importantly, how it's regulated. Um, you guys should be aware of um, uh, the fact that, in fact, this is highly regulated. And this is not just fly by night, what I, whatever I feel like doing. Um, so uh, uh, just a couple of facts versus myths. Um, so fact, is this a fact or a myth? Research animals are often kept in pain. And this is certainly a myth. The vast majority of biomedical research does not result in significant dis discomfort. In fact, this is an aspect that is very carefully scrutinized in each of these research protocols to get reviewed by the institutional board to ensure that animals are not kept in pain. Um, second, biomedical research involving lab animals has played a vital role in virtually every major medical advance of the last century. Is that true or false? And this one is a fact. That's actually quite astounding. Biomedical research in animals has played a vital role, that is a central role, in virtually every medical ma uh, major medical advance. So all the drugs that you're taking, all the machines that you use, that are used on you when you go into the hospital, have been tested, have been vetted, and sometimes have been, have been um, developed through the use of animal model systems. So that can't be underestimated. Um, every drug that you take is tested on animals. And the, the uh, cellular, physiological, uh, uh, molecular kinds of uh, um, um, effects are all tested on animals before it gets anywhere near your drugstore. Dogs, cats, and monkeys are the most popular research animals. Those are the ones that get post-tested over uh, the most. But this actually is a myth. The vast majority of research of animals are rodents. We talked about why. Mice and rats are bred for this purpose. There's no problems with um, 
um, uh, they, there are lots of mice, and the mice and rats are bred specifically for this purpose. Cats, dogs, and non-human primates account, all of them together, account for less than one half of one percent of all the total number of uh, uh, animals used in research, and that has declined uh, for more than 25 years. So yes, they're used. They're used in specific situations where their system is particularly valuable. We talked about where the non-human primates may be particularly valuable, but it's not like every other person is doing this. It's a very select number of groups, and there's lots of competition uh, for those groups uh, to do the, the highest quality of research. Um, last or next to last fact versus myth, stem cell research does not require animal models. So you remember stem cells are those pluripotent cells. By pluripotent, I mean the cells that can develop into any other cells in the body. So why is this important for neurobiology? Well, for example, Parkinson's disease that we're going to be talking about in the motor systems of uh, the class um, uh, uh, results from the death of neurons in one part of the brain called the substantia nigra. In theory, we can take stem cells, make them turn into substantia nigra cells, and then plop them right in to the substantia nigra of Parkinson's patients. Uh, hopefully, they will then grow to the right areas, and their symptoms will at least be lessened, if not cured. That is the hope. Same thing with Alzheimer's disease. There's lots of cell deaths in Alzheimer's disease. Can we somehow program stem cells to go in and regrow what needs to be regrown in the Alzheimer's brain where there's degeneration in the hippocampus uh, that starts in early memory impairment and then degeneration in the cortex that results in the later dementia that develops? That is the hope. And the, uh, the question here is the stem, stem cell research against stem cells come from humans um, does not require animal models. And that is absolutely not true. It's a myth um, that while stem cell research is very promising, any stem cell treatment must first demonstrate safety and efficacy in animal models before they can be used in humans. You can imagine this. It completely makes sense. We think we might be able to get these uh, stem cells to to, to turn into something that we want, but we certainly want to try injecting it in animals uh, that have damage in a particular area to see what happens before we start injecting stem cells that have been possibly even genetically modified into, human, um, into the human brain. So this area of research, which is so uh, exciting and has so much potential, still needs and has a, a critical animal uh, model component, an animal safety component. And finally, um, uh, the idea, uh, the question is animal research, or the statement is that animal research is the exploitation of one species, the rats or the, uh, the birds or the bats that we're using, for the exclusive benefit of another, that is us. We're just using the animals just for our own benefit so we can cure. Um, cancer, brain cancer, we can cure Alzheimer's disease. And that is also a myth, because all the biomedical research in animals also advances veterinary medicine. So all of the drugs that you get at the vet um, are also, and, and the procedures, and the treatments, and the cures, and the understanding of uh, your dog or your cat physiology um, has all benefited from research on other animals. And um, that's, that's all I have today. And so we'll be back uh, uh, next week for um, uh, the start of sensory motor systems.